We're living in some tough times. First, there was a pandemic about six months ago. Everything changed. Then there was some rioting and protesting, and I understand that crime is up in big cities, but what's really on my mind and so many of our minds right now is the approaching wildfires to our community. People have lost their homes. Some people have been displaced. There's smoke in the air. It's just an incredible time. And it's just a difficult time for many people. In fact, our church uh, decided to open up doors to people who were displaced this week. And people could come in and get some, well, some respite and just get some rest here. And so it's just a, it's just a difficult time. One thing that I thought of this week is that these things are like stressful rocks that we carry around. So I just brought in a rock from outside and I just want you to get this picture that when we go through stress, it's like a rock we pick up and we put it in our backpack. And over time, as we keep adding stressful elements, they just accumulate in our lives. And then it's, it's a rock that may seem so small and trivial, but it's just the last one that we can carry and we just kind of fall apart. We have overwhelming difficulty in our lives because these things accumulate just like a pile of rocks and we're carrying them around. I think one of the rocks that we can carry around right now especially is depression. We can just feel, well, depressed about everything that's going on and if you're like me, you walked out of your house and you got tree limbs everywhere and smoke in the air and your car is covered in ash and and so it's just a difficult time and that kind of stress and depression and is just really uh, uh, so relevant and it's right there in our face. The other thing that's happening, I think a rock that we can talk about is simply being separated from people and so maybe through the pandemic and so forth you haven't been able to see your grandparents or you haven't been able to connect with your family in a certain kind of way because you're trying to keep people safe and and so it's just a hard time because we're separated from family members and maybe you're separated from your work or something like that but the other thing that I'm sensing right now that people are going through I'm going to call it a rock that people are carrying around their backpack that's just weighing them down a rock that's accumulating is this feeling of isolation and loneliness I see it right now because of the fire and the smoke in the air is just a constant reminder that things aren't right. And if you feel all alone, if you feel isolated, it can be, well, more than ever right now. My phone just went off, and I know it's an alert to get out of the Thurston area. And so people are just scrambling. And so you got this kind of stress, anxiety, maybe a feeling of dread and loneliness. What am I, what am I going to do now? Now, this feeling of isolation that we can feel is a big deal. It really is. And here's our big idea today. Even in a pandemic, I find I found a reason for joy. Even when things are tough, I can find a reason for joy. You might be going through suffering. You might be wondering what's happening in your world. But can you find a source of joy even in this midst of isolation and difficulty? Now we're going to look at the Apostle Paul because Paul went through really difficult things. And in fact, at times he's very isolated from people. I'm sure he was lonely uh, during these times because he ended up in jail a lot. He would be preaching the gospel, he'd be persecuted, be beaten, and he'd be thrown in jail. He'd be all alone in a jail. Now Paul was an apostle, and that word means one sent on a mission. So God tagged Paul to be his man to start churches, and he started churches in the modern-day countries of Syria, Lebanon, Turkey, Greece, Italy. We call that the Mediterranean world. And as he went around starting these churches, he faced, well, he had his own rocks to carry, his own difficulty and his own stress. And often he ended up isolated and feeling all alone. And right now, some of you who are listening to, to me, you, you feel lonely. You feel all alone. And you're wondering what's going to happen in your life. And, and things are just so just so crazy. So we're going to look at a story today where Paul is in the city of Philippi and he gets arrested, thrown in the jail. And then a few years later, he writes Christians in that city a letter. So we're going to look at that and how Paul dealt with this loneliness and isolation and just difficulty. And I think we can connect with this story pretty well when we think about it in that way. So if you have a Bible, turn to Acts chapter 16, verse 19. 
Acts chapter 16, verse 19. And this is the beginning of how Paul ends up in jail in Philippi. Philippi, by the way, is a city, a Roman, uh, a Roman city in the uh, area of Turkey, modern-day Turkey. So here's how it When her owners realized that their hope of making money is gone, Paul and Silas just healed somebody who was a fortune teller. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought with them before the magistrates and said, These men are Jews and are throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for us Romans to accept or practice. The crowd joined in their attack against Paul and Silas, and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison, and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying, singing hymns to God, and the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once all the prisoners' doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. And Paul and Silas are singing this song and the doors open up. And it made me think that if Paul and Silas can sing to God and be joyful while they're shackled in the in this dungeon of a Roman prison cell, then I think I can survive wearing a mask and singing to God and choosing to have an attitude of joy. If Paul and Silas can do that, I think I can do that as well. So they're jailed in the city of uh, Philippi, and I'm thinking as they eventually leave the city, in fact, the story goes on that they lead the jailer to Christ, and it's just a miraculous story. As they lead, what must I do to be saved? The jailer says, and they say, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. So Paul eventually leaves Philippi and then he returns and writes them a letter. And it got me to thinking that if Paul was on Yelp or Google, what kind of rating would he give the city of Philippi? I think he'd give them one star, right? That's what you would do. Philippi, terrible place. Don't go there. They don't like anybody. It's the place I was beaten. One star for that city. One star for the people there. No, Paul doesn't do that. He connected with people there in a significant way. And so even though he's gone and he turns around and sends them a letter, guess what? He's in jail again. This time in a Roman cell. He's in Rome. And it's just an astonishing story that a few years later he can send them a letter. So here's our big idea today. I just want to say it again. Even in a pandemic... I found a reason for joy. Here's what I want you to do right now. In the chat bar, I want you to tell me what your reason for joy is. That's right. Just do that right now. What's your reason for joy? And then maybe just go on to Facebook right now or, or some social media and just put out why you're joyful today. I mean, shock the world. You can even say, even in a firestorm, I found this to be joyful about. Even in the smoke-filled world, I found this to be joyful about. Even, even in a pandemic, I found a reason for joy. You see, if Paul and Silas can find a reason for joy in the middle of a prison, then I think we can too. I think we need to maybe look beyond our present circumstances and just find that reason. So if you have your Bible, turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, and this is the letter that Paul sends back to those people As he goes from the prison in Philippi, he goes and starts other churches, and then he gets in prison again in Rome, and he sends them this letter. Here's what he says to them in verse 3. I thank my God every time I remember you, and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion till the day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about all of you, since I have you in my heart, and whether I am in chains, that would be prison, or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus, and this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to, pr- able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless in the day of Christ. 
So Paul says, even in the midst of this jail cell in Rome, I found a reason to be joyful, even when I think about my time in Philippi. So what we want to do is I'm going to give you four ways to get these rocks kind of out of your backpack. The rock of depression, the rock of loneliness, the rock of isolation, you just name it. The things that you're carrying in your life right now, how am I going to deal with those? And I'm going to give you some really concrete things to think about. Okay, here we go. Number one, to get these rocks, these things out of our lives so we can have joy is this. The gospel brings us together. That's right. The gospel brings us together. This is what Paul says in verse 4. In all my prayers for all of you, I pray always with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. That's the word we want to emphasize here, that phrase, the partnership we have in the gospel. The word gospel, by the way, means good news. What is the good news? Well, the good news is this. You can have a relationship with Jesus right now. Your sins can be forgiven. The God of heaven, the one true God, the creator of everything, wants to have a relationship with you. He wants you to know him. God longs for you to know him. That's the good news. The good news is that you can have purpose. You can have direction. The good news is you can have guidance. The good news is that when you go through a pandemic, you go through a fire, you go through a terrible circumstance, the good news is that God is there to walk with you. doesn't mean that bad things will never happen to you. Oh, it doesn't mean that at all. But it does mean that God is there when you need him to help you during a difficult time. Now, the word partnership is sometimes translated fellowship. It's the word koinonia. In fact, it's the name of our church, right? Grace Community Fellowship. And the idea of this term fellowship is sometimes it's used of the business partnership. It had to do with a close relationship. And what Paul is saying is that people in this church and his relationship with them was such that they had a partnership based on something that will never go away. The gospel is eternal. You see, it doesn't change. For 2,000 years, people have been following Jesus. And for 2,000 years, people have been joyful about the gospel. And for 2,000 years, it is the gospel that has brought people together. Like never before, we need to have that common thread that really binds us together. We don't use this word fellowship very often, but it's what the word partnership means. And, you know, even though our church is named that, we talk about having maybe a fellowship in a medical practice or an academic fellowship. And we have uh, uh, the Lord of the Rings thing with the fellowship of the ring. And it all signifies a close bonding partnership together in something. Now, Paul seems to have this loyalty with the people of this church because well, they were committed to him, and Paul says, we've had it since day one, since I got there. Paul says, I ended up in Philippi. You trusted Christ. They threw me in jail. You helped me when I needed to flee the city. You helped support me even after that. I mean, Paul is loyal. You think about loyalty, you know, who, who are you loyal to? And who's loyal to you? Who is it that you can call at midnight? and say, we got to get out of here. Can we come over? Who are those folks in your life? When you're facing bankruptcy, who's going to help you? When you're facing a terrible time in your family, when life is uncertain, who is it that you're going to turn to? Now, here's the thing about Paul, his relationship with this church. If you ended up in jail, the only way you could eat food is if somebody on the outside gave you money or gave you food. It's not like our jails here today where they just automatically feed you and take care of you. You needed some outside support. So when the folks in Philippi heard that Paul was in jail, they start sending him money. They send him some friends too to say, hey, we're going to help you out. And they, and they send him 800 miles they had to travel. Wow, Paul is so impressed with that. He go, man, I'm in jail, I'm in prison, I'm here in Rome, and, and I've gone since I've left you in Philippi, and you've not stopped remembering me. And Paul says, in return, I haven't stopped praying for you. That's important stuff. That's incredible. And Paul says, hey, when, when, when we connect with the gospel, something unique happens. You know, as a follower of Christ, when we serve together 
in ministry or we focus together in a gospel, there's just, I don't know quite how to describe it. It's like this, this bond between us that's stronger than a blood bond, a family bond. It's just something that, that happens with us. It just connects us in some way, that, that bonding. 18 years ago, our church, uh, we were feeding people under the Washington Jefferson Street Bridge and 700 people showed up and the, the folks I stood with next serving food, I connected with them. We bonded. Following year, we went to Wow Hall and served several hundred people a Thanksgiving meal and I sat next to my buddy Hugh and it's in my small group even today and we just connected there, right? When you when you have that common thread, it just brings you together. I've been on mission trips with people from our church to Mexico to build houses or to uh, uh, lead vacation Bible schools. And so when you do that with people, it just brings you together. I just got back last year from Myanmar with a team from Grace, and it just connected us to be serving together and teaching together and watch what God is doing. When I was a youth pastor, all these connections with my youth ministry staff, and those are lifelong connections. Why? Because we are centered on the gospel that Jesus Christ is everything. And when we make sure that we connect with each other on the basis of the gospel, it brings us together. It's the glue. The gospel is the glue of rock-solid friendships. The gospel is the glue of rock-solid friendships, and we need this. Hey, here's the second way to get kind of these rocks out of our lives of anxiety and stress, isolation, loneliness, and here it is. Number two, be thankful for the people in your life. Paul says this in verse three, I thank my God every time I remember you. Are you thankful for the people in your life? I mean, sure, you can be thankful for the people who are nice to you. I mean, anybody can do that. But are you thankful for the cranky people in your life? Are you th Now, don't look at people in the room. I can already feel it. We're not even together that you're looking around. You know, just think about this. Are you thankful for the people God has brought into your life? I mean, that's a choice that you need to make. It's easy to be thankful for the nice people. And Paul says, I thank God for them. And I think that's a habit we need to get into to get rid of the, that cumulative stress as we often realize that stress or loneliness is caused by relationships with people. Therefore, we need to try to practice the attitude of being grateful for people. So let me ask you, who's your best friends? I mean, if I asked you today, hey, just write out the three or four people who are your best friends, who would, who would they be? Now I'm guessing, might be people in your family, might, might be on your list. But I'm also guessing it's the people you went through some difficulty with. It's the person you stayed up late with studying to cram for that exam you had to take, for that final you had to take. It's the people you went through some, like, sports team. I remember being on a sports team and, man, we were just trying to win a game that year. We went 0-11. I mean, I'm the starting quarterback of a team that's 0-11. It was terrible, but you know what? I had a connection with the team, right? And then a couple years later, we play for a state championship. I mean, you just have that connection as you go through something difficult, difficult wise, or a struggle that you go through. You know, as you go through a struggle with your family and you share that with somebody else who says, I've been there and here's the struggle I'm going through, and you share those struggles together then it kind of bonds you, but you got to be thankful for the people in your life. I made a list of my friends this week. I actually did it. I just wrote down, who are the people in my life? And such a common thread. It's the people that, well, I've gone through life together with. It's not an accident. I'm centered on the gospel, and I'm thankful for the people who have gone through it with me. Now, for some of you, I'm very sensitive about this. It's talking about friendship is a hard for some of you because you feel like you don't have any friends. Or you feel like you're all alone and you don't even know where to go, but you know that you need some friendships in your life, especially right now. You just need people. For some of you, you don't have that issue. You need to be proactive in being a good friend to others. So right now during this pandemic, during this really difficult time of fires and uh, other stress-related things and people feeling all alone, we can be proactive and step out to others. And on the other hand, if you have some hurts in your life, I want you to think about this. Past relationships have created 
baggage in your life. You don't trust people. It's the friend who betrayed you. It's the relative who betrayed a confidence. It's the person who abused you and you're carrying that difficulty around. I understand that. And as your pastor, I want you to know, I want you to really know this, that we sympathize with that. And I want you to know that God can help you work through those things so you can begin to trust people again instead of focusing on the negative. Sometimes we can just focus on the past. And sometimes, yes, we can play the victim. But God can help us deal with those things. He can grant to us, through the power of the Holy Spirit, a way to get through those things. It's not that we forget that they happened. It's that we can work through them and grow past them anyway. If anyone had bad experiences in life, it was the Apostle Paul, the guy who wrote this letter. He had been beaten five times, shipwrecked, in jail a lot. He had been flogged. That's being whipped 39 times. He knew what it was to be hungry, to be tired, to be all alone. And yet, he was able to say, I'm thankful for the people in my life. Here's the third way to get rid of these rocks or to deal with the cumulative things that are just piling up in your backpack and weighing you down. And here it is, number three, focus on what God is doing. Sometimes we focus on circumstances. Now let me give you an example of this. I want you to just think about this. I want you to think about your life and just look at the other people in your life and what's going on. And I want you to try to identify what is God doing in my world? What is God doing? And maybe you might think, you know what? I saw five people baptized at Grace Community Fellowship a couple weeks ago. God is doing something there. We got another person who wants to be baptized. God is doing something there. You know, the church opened its doors to people who are displaced. Maybe God is doing something there. So I want you to remember that. God is always at work, and he's at work in your life. He is always at work. One of the principles I learned from an author named Henry Blackaby is simply this, that we should see what God is doing and then join God in what he's doing. Join him. Sometimes we try to do things for God, and then we ask God to help us. Maybe it should be the other way around. We watch and see what God is doing, the lives he's transforming, and then we, got, well, then we join God in that. Philippians 1.6 says this, Being confident of this, he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. God is working on your life. In fact, that passage says he began something, He's going to take it to completion. He started something, it's going to be finished. And what he started was something incredible on the inside of your life, and he's transforming you. Remember this, he started something incredible in the lives of people around you, and he's going to finish that too. And you get to be a part of that. That's fantastic. See, we must never forget that God is at work. See what God is doing. So take a look at your own life internally. What is God doing in your life? And I know what some of you are going to say, well, he's not doing anything. You need to reflect a little bit more on this. Pinpoint what it is. What am I learning from God? Maybe you're learning patience. Maybe it's the people in your life. You need to learn patience. And you're going, yeah, I, I need to make some progress in that regard. Or maybe it's that you actually dislike some people. You hate some people. And maybe you need to make progress in that area. And you see that God is working on you chiseling away the rough parts and bringing you to completion. Some of you have a hard time like trusting people. Maybe this is a time that God is teaching you to trust people. And maybe during this time like never before, God is teaching you to trust him. Where's my next paycheck going to come from? Where are my kids going to go to school? What about this online business? It's never going to work, you think. Well, probably not. But you know what? Trust God anyway. Trust him, even though you cannot see what is happening. Transformation is a spiritual process. He who, Jesus, began something good in you, that word colossus means beautiful, began something beautiful in you, is going to carry it on to completion. That's God's business. Trust him to do it. Walk by faith. Don't walk by sight. When he prompts you to do something, do it. Every believer has a purpose and direction and a destiny. You need to be aware of what God is doing in your life. You need to be aware of what God is doing and join him in this. 
God always finishes what he starts. Anybody watching me ever try to start a remodel and quit? Try to paint a room and you go, I don't know. I don't want to finish painting the baseboards. No one will ever see it. You start a project and you don't finish. A lot of people are like that. You start something, you don't finish. You start a jigsaw puzzle, you don't finish. You know what? God started something in your life and he's going to finish it. Guaranteed. You can bank on it. God has started something in your life. And if you have spiritual friends, they've made commitments to Christ, God is doing something in their life too. And God is going to carry it on to completion as well. God always finishes what he starts. Here's the fourth thing that we can do when it comes to those rocks, that isolation rock or the depression rock or the loneliness rock. And here it is, number four, express God's love to the people in your life. That's right. Tell people that you love them. Express it to them. Show that to them. Make sure that you base your relationships on, not on performance, but on God's grace. People who actually love each other and have that kind of kindred spirit and bond, well, they stick through things through thick and thin. And Paul had overwhelming affection for them because when he was overwhelmed by adversity, they were there for them. So when you see someone overwhelmed by adversity, you need to overwhelm them with admiration and a kindred spirit as well. Philippians 1.8 says, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Christ Jesus. He's in jail. He wants to see them. Verse 9, and this is my prayer. Notice this, underline it. His prayer is that your love may abound more and more in knowledge. He's talking about the love that believers have for each other. He's saying we have this relationship that's based on God's love, and we need to learn how to love each other. It's the kind of love that only comes from Jesus Christ because we cannot love each other from pure motives. We're going to be selfish in life, let's face it. And what we need is God's love working in our lives, and Paul wants that for us. That's why he prays for that. Now, he goes, I have this affection for you, this, this fondness for you, and the actual word there is, is the root word is bowels, like your intestines. You know how we say, hey, I love you with all my heart? Yeah, yeah, guys, hey, yeah, you tell your wife, hey, you tell your girlfriend, hey, I love you with all my heart. But what if you said, you know, I love you with all my bowels. I love you with all my kidney. In fact, the word can sometimes mean kidney. Doesn't work very well, does it? In fact, that's not going to work well at Valentine's Day. And what Paul is saying, just though from the depth of his inner being, we need to really love people. The purpose statement of our church is pretty simple. Love people where they're at and help them follow Jesus. Love people where they're at. No matter where they're at in their emotions, their spiritual lives, they might be far away from God. They might be atheists or agnostics. They might be Christians. They might, just People are all over the spiritual map. Love people where they're at. They might be happy or angry or sad or jealous or lonely. Love people where they're at. And right now we have people with a gamut of emotions. And one of the things that we can do as followers of Christ is to love people where they're at and help them follow Jesus. To do this, we need to be able to express this in meaningful ways. I'll give you a couple things for our church. We have a benevolent fund. Yesterday, I took a $500 check to somebody who needed some help. Did that. And I said, on behalf of our church, we love you. And uh, she started crying. They lost their home in the fire. They needed some help right then. They had some family members they could stay with. But I wanted to make sure that we took action quickly. And I knew the people of Grace Community Fellowship would want nothing less. Let's act quickly. That's one way that we can express love. Here's another way that as a church we're expressing love to our community. We have um, invited the YMCA to come in and use our building because they had a need. They're doing, I can't quite describe it. If I said a study hall for kids right now, it's, it's a way to help families who are struggling with, hey, I can't watch my kids and go to work, and they need a place to do their homework. And so the YMCA has a program for that. And we were going to develop our own, but you know what? 
We had the building, they had the program, it was a match. So we're gonna have 75 kids in our building for a while. We don't know how long. We don't even know how it's gonna work, but I do know this. It's an expression of love to our community, and that's what we're about. So we can do that on a church-wide level, but we need to do it as individuals too. We need to express love to others. And here's, here's, my, here's my point. Everyone needs to be in some sort of community group. Sometimes we just call them small groups in the past, but I want to use this word terminology shifted a little bit, community group. It's a place where we can have community with you know, 6 to 12 people who meet on a regular basis either on Zoom or some type of online thing or maybe in person if you feel comfortable with that, all those things where you can connect. Because my great concern right now is that people have the rock of isolation, the rock of loneliness, and they need to connect more than ever. That's where you come in. That's where we can bind together around the gospel to make sure that people are connected to Jesus and connected to relationships as well. One of the reasons we need to be in these groups is because I'll just give you some examples from my small group lately, the last year or two, is that, hey, somebody's parent dies unexpectedly. They need some help. They need somebody to pray for them. You give them the call because they're in your group. You offer them support. A member of your group has surgery on their Achilles tendon and they're cranky at home. Gosh, I wonder who that could be. But you know what? They need somebody from their small group to show up and play them in a game of cribbage and they let the person who had the surgery win so that I feel better about myself or that person feels better about themselves. Yeah, that's what small groups do. That's what a community group does. Or you're going through a tough time in your family and you got teenagers at home. Oh my goodness. You got teenagers at home? Okay, you need to be in a group, right? See, everybody needs in a group. Now, here's what happens. There will be a time where you need a sounding board in your life. You're going to make a big decision. Do I move away from Eugene? Do I take a different kind of job? I have an important decision to make. I need a group of people to help me process that. You see, there are all kinds of benefits to being involved in a community group. First off, you get to give to others, and it feels great to give to others. And there will be times you need to receive from others. How are we going to do that in a church that's as big as ours? Well, we need to be in these smaller community groups as well. Okay, now the examples are endless why we need to be in groups. So I'm going to tell you how it's going to work this fall. Okay, here's how it's going to work. I've written this little devotional. It's 31 days through Proverbs. It's called God's Twitter feed. And I want to encourage you to get one of these books. How do I get it? You go online. Uh, and you just order it. And then we'll have it available here to pick up. You don't buy it off Amazon. You just you just let us know and we'll get it to you. We have a form for you to click. Just go to our webpage, go online, and you can do that. Now then, you can also join a group by going to our webpage, going to our Facebook page, and just click uh, the, the community group link. And on that, you just fill in your name, your email address, and we will try to match you with a group. There's another way to do this, and I'm very excited about this. It's that you say, hey, you know what, Steve? I'll just grab some of these books, watch your nine-minute videos. There are five of them, one each week, five weeks in a row. Read through the book of Proverbs, and then you can grab the people in your life. It's the contacts in your phone. Say, I'll start my own group. Some of you are pretty socially outgoing. That works for you. Hey, I'll just start my own group. I'll contact my friends. I'll just gather a group. I'll just watch those YouTube videos once a week, and we'll have a short discussion, and we'll pray for each other. I'll go through the, through the online training that you have, which is it's a short and brief. We'll get you started. So I call that grab and go. So you go online, or you do the grab and go. You do that both. Or you can just direct message us on Facebook, send us an email. You can even call our church office. We'll try to help you connect with a group. So let me say all that again. Even during a pandemic, even during a firestorm, even when I lose my job, even when I'm hurting, I found a reason for joy. One of the ways that you need to find that joy right now is to connect with a group of people. You can do that by going to our webpage. You can do that by clicking on those links, sending us a message, sending us an email, and old school, pick up the phone and call us. We'll help you connect. I'm so excited about this because for years, Mary and I have, well, in fact, since, since we've been married, we've been 
part of a community group. It's just part of our rhythm of life. I want that for you. I want that for you. And I want that for our church because we have many people who have too many rocks and they're feeling isolated and alone during this time. So let's bind together to do that. Let me pray for us. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son Jesus Christ and that he unites us together through uh, his gospel. Lord, I just pray for each person listening to me right now that you would connect our hearts together in community groups, that we can have meaningful and tangible relationships that encourage us. And I pray this in the powerful name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Have a great week, and I hope you get connected.